Hey everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of A View from Tracy's Point. And I wanted to come and give you guys a quick video. Um, Attorney Steve Greenberg um, has filed his reply to the government's opposition um, to R. Kelly being released based on COVID-19. It's a seven page document that I'm going to read to you guys. <laughs> so before I do, someone um, had asked a question on Twitter and I didn't know if other people had a similar question but um, they were asking why are there so many different judges or three different judges operating on this Eastern District of New York indictment and so Ann Donnelly is the judge she's the federal judge overseeing this case and when you hear them talk about the magistrates, magistrates are not, and I think I said in my last video that they were over the federal judges. That's not correct. The magistrates are like under the federal judges and they basically fill in. For example, um, last week, a magistrate filled in for Ann Dunley because um, she was unavailable for whatever reason. And then I believe the other magistrate judge that they mentioned was actually assigned to do the arraignment back in July or August after he was initially arrested. And I believe that was before Ann Dunley was assigned to the case. And so magistrates can be assigned to sit in on procedural hearings, um, but they don't have the authority to make any you know, any decisions on the case as far as dismissing charges or you know, sentencing and that type of thing. And so I didn't know if anybody else had that question. I saw that on Twitter. And there was one other thing that had came up that I said the next time I was going to do a video, I was going to answer that question. But if I think of it by the end of um, reading this response, I will throw that in. So let's go ahead and get started. It says, Dear Ann, I'm sorry, Dear Judge Donnelly, we respectfully submit this letter as Mr. Kelly's reply in support of his most recent request from release from pretrial detention, at least on a temporary basis. The government once again attempts to prop up and excuse the failed actions of the MCC Chicago in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Defending the MCC Chicago is getting harder and harder to do, and the government's attempts to vouch for, its, for it ignores the facts. In any event, as accurately predicted by Mr. Kelly and his counsel to this court weeks ago, in the context of these bond motions, the COVID-19 crisis at the MCC Chicago has grown exponentially and will continue to do so while the government and this court continue to turn the blind eye to the situation. Indeed, at the inception of these motions, the MCC Chicago was publicly proclaiming that it was doing everything possible to combat COVID-19 within its walls and that it had no confirmed positive cases at all. Just as suddenly, the MCC Chicago was ultimately forced to admit and report that its zero numbers were really 26 positive cases between detainees and staff. Ambulances came and individuals were removed and hospitalized. Subsequently, the MCC Chicago's reported numbers became 48 positive detainee cases along with 26 personnel. Ambulances came and individuals were removed and hospitalized. Just as fast, the MCC Chicago's number of positive cases for detainees alone has now jumped to more than 108. Ambulances came and individuals were removed and hospitalized. Accordingly, the government's continued assurances to this court that Mr. Kelly and the detainees are getting all the protection they need 
And then in parentheses, it says, and apparently from the government's perspective, all that they deserve in parentheses rings hollow and is entirely disingenuous. The fact is that even soap is in short supply, masks are inadequate and need to be repeatedly reused without being clean and the MCC simply does not have enough tests to make an accurate count. After all, the numbers are constrained by the number of actual tests that are being given. The fact is that the BOP numbers cannot be trusted. And you guys know BOP is um, the Bureau of Prisons. Um, testing at BOP facilities has varied widely. The BOT acknowledges that some facilities are simply not testing for COVID-19. That means that at any facility that self-reports zero cases may simply not be testing for the virus. See United States versus Asaro 2020 WL. And then it goes on with the case number. And this was a case that was filed in the Eastern District of New York on April 17th, um, 2020. And then in parentheses, it says, noting that where there are no reported cases in the facility, absence more absent more information about how much testing the BOP is conducting, it is possible that undetected cases are present in the facility. And that's the end of the quote. And then it says, second, all the BOP facilities where people are sick, dead, or dying started out with zero reported cases and the situation turned deadly quickly. Comparing the situation in BOP facilities to what is happening in the rest of the country only puts the crisis into starker contrast. In BOP facilities, even with the fudging of numbers, there are 12.84 COVID-19 infections per 1,000 people as compared with 3.51 infections per 1,000 people in the United States. And even this number is plainly wrong because of gross under testing. So they're basically saying that you're three times more likely to get COVID if you're in a prison than if you, if you are walking around on the street. Testing matters. Out of 2,700 tests conducted nationwide by the BOP, nearly 2,000 came back positive, roughly 70%. If this figure is generalizable to the broader population in the BOP's care, all of these people are in grave danger. We should not feel com comforted by a facility reporting zero cases if that facility is not testing any of the people in its care. Moreover, because of how quickly COVID-19 spreads in a detention environment, facilities with zero cases can become deadly hotspots within a matter of days or weeks. Thus, the government's attempts in this response brief to quibble about whether Mr. Kelly's medical numbers really make him diabetic or whether he is merely pre-diabetic entirely misses the point. First of all, that quibbling ignores the fact that he is going to cross the threshold into diabetic and soon. The government's response otherwise utterly fails to address this very real medical risk. Medical consensus is unequivocal. I keep mispronouncing this word. Unequivocal. Diabetes, when coupled with other health conditions, greatly increases the complications from COVID-19. It is a difficult to manage diabetes on a prison's, I'm sorry, it is difficult to manage diabetes on a prison's standard menu. Prison food is sort of the opposite of what would be a medical, medically appropriately. Prison food is sort of the opposite of what would be a medically appropriate diabetes diet. Christy Thompson, when your insulin pump is contraband, the Marshall Project, April 22nd, 2015, and then it gives the link um, to this article. Um, they say, quoting Sarah Fetch, a state a staff attorney with the American Diabetes Association's Legal Advocacy Program. In addition, in recent weeks, there has been significant data 
that indicates the mere contraction of the virus can have a long-term, if not permanent, effect on the lungs, resulting in irreversible damage to the pulmonary system. Beyond that, Mr. Kelly is at substantial risk and in danger, regardless of whether his diagnostic numbers firmly put him in any defined medical category. He is at risk and in danger because he is housed at the MCC Chicago. For that reason, he must be released, at least on a temporary basis. What more is there to wait for? This continued detention at the MCC Chicago makes it a virtual certainty that he will be failed by COVID-19. The only question then will be whether he lives or dies. Maybe at that point, the government will finally admit that this has been a failed experiment in Russian roulette with Mr. Kelly's health and that the MCC Chicago's efforts are not really getting the job done. Okay, y'all, this sound like Steve Greenberg sick of their asses over there, okay? <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know who wrote this motion uh, because they come in with it. And then it's, they have like a whole bunch of um, articles, you know, backing up what they're saying. And they have a couple of cases, I guess, that have been filed on behalf of other inmates. And so it goes on to say the focus of the government's other arguments in its response are equally non-compelling. Inexplicably, the government feels inexplicably, the government feels the urge to repeatedly belittle defense counsel and their arguments in support of Mr. Kelly's motion for release. For example, the government characterizes defense counsel's claim that Mr. Kelly does not possess a passport as untrue. The government offers no basis and certainly no evidence for that contention, nor is there any basis or evidence to make such an accusation. Mr. Kelly's passport is in the possession of law enforcement in Cook County, Illinois. Okay, y'all, I'm snapping, I'm snapping. In the event, the government once again entirely misses the point with respect to the issue of risk of flight. It is exceedingly difficult to even travel through the barren airports of the United States during this pandemic, much less for someone who is not as internationally recognizable as Mr. Kelly. The government's pathetically weak response to that is, well, maybe Mr. Kelly could wear a mask to disguise himself from the public. The government's desperate arguments border on the silly. Additionally, it would be prejudicial if the court refuses to consider that Mr. Kelly does not have a criminal record or to find that he is likely to flee. Such conclusions are unfounded and there has been no evidence presented to this court that has established that Mr. Kelly is likely to flee. The government next argues that Mr. Kelly could, quote, leave his home on foot by car or public transport heading in any direction for any indeterminate amount of time before being apprehended by law enforcement. End quote. Of course, the government offers no factual support for that contention either, nor is there any evidence to suggest this would be the likely result. That argument also flies in the face of the fact that within the Northern District of Illinois, where Mr. Kelly would be on release from detention, electronic monitoring and home confinement are regularly and successfully used for all types of federal criminal detainees, including rich and poor, black and white, the famous and the unknown. In fact, the location where Mr. Kelly would be housed is less than one mile from the federal courthouse in Chicago and close to both local police stations and members of federal law enforcement, as well as even the Chicago Police Department's own headquarters. That location does not present any unique transportation issues. Moreover, with electronic monitoring, home confinement or GPS tracking and movement by Mr. Any movement by Mr. Kelly would be known to law enforcement before he even hits the elevator of the building, which would hardly provide him with a handy and effective escape route, as argued by the government in its response. Nonetheless, in support of the government's assertion that electronic monitoring is ineffective, it cites two 
1993 court opinions. Surely the government does not believe that the technology of today has not advanced from that of nearly 30 years ago. Electronic monitoring and GPS are routinely used because they are highly reliable and effective means of ensuring that a defendant is monitored and appears in court. To the extent the government parrots this court's opinion that the quote judicial system oversight capabilities are curtailed, Ms. End quote, Mr. Kelly and his counsel repeat the concerns raised in, this mo in his motion. Where is there factual or record support for this? There is none. Certainly that argument has not been raised by either the U.S. Attorney's Office or Pretrial Services in the Northern District of Illinois. Simply put, there is no evidence that Pretrial Services is incapable of monitoring Mr. Kelly, nor is there any record evidence that he is likely to fee to flee, nor is there any evidence that he poses a danger to the public. These are mere speculative arguments put forth by the government. Speculation is not enough. See United States versus Lee 972, and then it goes on, and this was a case out of the Eastern District of New York in 2013. And then it says relaxing conditions of pretrial release because, quote, speculation about the possibility that Lee might disclose information during treatment that suggests he poses a threat is no substitute for evidence that he poses one now. And then another case, United States versus Bodmer, which was heard in the Southern District of New York in 2004. And they have in parentheses granting pretrial release where, quote, the government's argument is mere speculation because it provides no evidence that Bodmer has any bank accounts outside of Switzerland, end quote, that he could use to finance flight emphasis in original. Um, and then he's just saying that there's more emphasis on this statement in the original document for the judge to go back and review. And then it goes on to say, in addition to substituting speculation for evidence, this argument fails to address, quote, whether the presumption of dangerousness is rebutted, end quote, given, one, the nature and circumstances of the crime charge, two, the weight of the evidence against the defendant, three, the history and characteristics of the defendant, including family ties, employment, community ties, past conduct, and for the nature and seriousness of the danger to the community or to an individual. And that was Mercedes. And then it goes on um, with the case information. Then he goes on to say, furthermore, the government's attack upon, upon defense counsel, Mr. Anton, are quite simply unprofessional and offensive where the prosecutors imply that Mr. Anton would somehow use the small amount of funds that have been raised for Mr. Kelly's defense fund to help him flee. First of all, to impugn the integrity of a fellow member of the bar in that manner is frankly unconscionable. Moreover, it is obvious the government monitors these fundraising activities. The government even recently went so far as to dispatch agents to interview some of those involved with those fundraising efforts. So the prosecutors are well aware that less than $10,000 has been raised. To put the government's unprofessional attack in context, would be attuned to defense counsel arguing likewise without any basis that they fear the government is going to hide witnesses so that they will not testify in a favorable manner to Mr. Kelly at trial. That would certainly seem to be sanctionable conduct. Okay, they done talked about Greenberg free and he got an attitude now. So it goes on to say the government has repeatedly appears to rely upon the fact that Mr. Kelly is a beloved public figure with fans as a basis to keep him incarcerated. Previously, the government suggested without any support by way of evidence whatsoever that Mr. Kelly was somehow responsible for others social media postings. The government actually well knows that Mr. Kelly is no more responsible for social media postings attacking those who side with the government than the government is responsible 
for postings attacking Mr. Kelly, there are many of the latter variety. The same is true with respect to fans who want to put money on his books at the MCC Chicago so that he can buy Cheetos out of a machine. In other words, to suggest those same fans are going or could bankroll his escape is other foolishness and has no evidentiary support in the record. Lastly, the notion floated by the government that Mr. Kelly will attempt to intimidate or persuade witnesses is again unsupported by any facts. Were he to do so, those individuals would immediately notify the government and Mr. Kelly would end up back in the slammer. The best evidence that he could not try to obstruct justice is that for the two years prior to being indicted and while all of the hubbub was going on about Mr. Kelly, including the quote, I mean, I'm sorry, the hashtag mute R. Kelly campaign, the airing of the surviving R. Kelly documentary, the production of the second surviving R. Kelly documentary, the cancellation of his live music performances and the cancellation of his music streaming services, Mr. Kelly never once tried to obstruct justice or influence anyone or anything, including the witnesses in this case. Beyond that, the government is well aware that even after Mr. Kelly was indicted in Illinois in state court, and before he was indicted in federal court in Chicago and New York, he never once attempted to influence anyone, obstruct justice, or to flee. It should be pointed out that all of the alleged victims known as Jane Doe's have remained concealed by the government. To date, defense counsel has not been provided with all of the identities of the alleged victims. It is unequivocal that the coronavirus pandemic has created a change in circumstances which permits the court to reconsider Mr. Kelly's release. As a result of the pandemic, Mr. Kelly cannot adequately prepare for trial. The presumption of innocence to which Mr. Kelly is entitled should not be ignored based on a finding that Mr. Kelly is likely to flee. Whereas here, there is no evidence in the record which leads to the conclusion and denial of release is tantamount to him being found guilty. Mr. Kelly should not be afforded any less consideration as a pretrial defendant than the multitude of other defendants who have been released even post conviction based on the pandemic for similar or worse crimes that would represent disparate treatment and would be extremely prejudicial to Mr. Kelly's due process rights. The court should therefore grant Mr. Kelly release from pretrial detention with conditions. Okay, so this was, um, wow, <laughs> Steve Greenberg is, is, he's fed up. I don't know if Steve wrote this or if Michael Leonard wrote it. They're both on here um, respectfully submitted. And then they have a certificate of service. The undersigned states that on May 6, 2020, he caused the above to be e-filed and served upon all parties of record by using the court's e-filing system. So um, Michael Leonard actually submitted this response. And I'm going to say that Michael Leonard wrote this because I was thinking as I was reading it that it didn't have as many typos and things that Greenberg normally has in his motions. And the language um, is a little more on an upper level than what um, Greenberg motion is. So I'm going to say that Michael Leonard wrote this. So guys, um, I like how they defended Anton, even though I still think that um, Anton should not be communicating with YouTubers and shouldn't be, you know, refereeing arguments, you know, because a lot of that stuff that back and forth and carrying on, I'd be wondering if it's staged or what's going on or if it's real. But in any event, I still believe it. I will stand firm in that belief that it's unprofessional for Anton to be going on these um, YouTube channels. I think it's different than last week when he did the interview on that channel that is okay that's no different than him being interviewed on court tv but for him to be you know up two o'clock at night watching the live stream and then 
you know, two people get to arguing and then he's going to play the referee. I still think that that's just doing too much. But I am glad that Leonard did um, stand up for him and say, hey, you're out of line. You're not going to talk about, you know, my fellow attorney this way. And then I do like the fact that they are calling BS on the Eastern District of New York and their motion that is condescending is unprofessional you know the accusations that they're making are unfounded there's no proof that um, R. Kelly would flee there's no proof that he has any intentions of fleeing and there's no proof that Anton regardless whether it was ten thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars there's no proof that he would risk his life risk going to jail in order to help R. Kelly get this money. And actually, I was doing some research on um, crowdfunding a defense and the money has to go into a trust. They can't just, like Anton can't collect this money from the supporters and then turn the money over to R. Kelly. Um, I think the only way he would be able to return the money and each state has their own rules, like some states don't even allow attorneys to crowdfund um, money for defense, but where Anton's license is, he is allowed to do that. But I believe in most of the states that I read up on, he cannot give that money to R. Kelly until after the trial is over, all bills have been paid, and then if there's any money left over, he could in turn turn that money over um, to the defendant or to R. Kelly if there was money left over, but that wouldn't happen until after all these cases have been disposed of and he's found not guilty and all of that. So, you know, for the government to even assert that, I do agree it was petty, but they've been petty all along. So I can't say that we're surprised. And so um, um, Judge Dunley, usually once the defense files their response to the opposition, Judge Dunley usually waits about two days before she files her decision on how she's going to rule. Um, and I think she does that to give the the um, prosecution a chance to respond or to rebut if they are even allowed to rebut at this point. Um, it's sort of like closing arguments. They only they get to present and then the person can rebut then the next person can come back but they don't get to go back and forth and back and forth so hopefully we'll hear something from her within the next 24 to 48 hours so guys that's it um for this reading of the defense's response to the opposition to their motion that was filed last week leave your comments below and let me know what you think and until the next time, I shall talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.